All right, in this video, we're gonna look at using some of the error formulas for estimating how far off our answers might be when we use some of the numerical integration formulas that we've talked about. Okay, so here we have a definite integral. We're supposed to integrate from negative one to one of e to the x squared dx. Uh, this, we've seen a function similar to this before. Uh, this is actually a non-elementary integral. You'll learn some more of that, about that in calculus too. Uh, but what that means basically is that you're not going to write down a nice ordinary kind of function for an antiderivative. Uh, so it has, it doesn't have an ordinary, the usual way that we might find an antiderivative. Uh, so that we can't really use fundamental theorem of calculus in the way that we usually do. Okay, so uh, we really can't use fundamental theorem of calculus, so numerical approximation methods are appropriate here. Okay, so from negative one to one, we've got a picture of the function. This graph here shows y equals e to the x squared. And although you don't need a picture, it's helpful in thinking about what you're doing here. And we're supposed to integrate from negative one to one. So when we look at this graph, uh, that function's always positive everywhere actually, but in particular on this interval from negative one to one. So what that integral would represent is the true area of that region between that function and the x-axis. So just because there's a little grid here on this graph, you can actually kind of look at that and sort of count up the areas of the squares there. Those are all one by one squares on that grid. And you can see you can have about two full squares here on the bottom and then some pieces of squares that might add up to about another square. So just by looking at the picture here, uh, you can make an estimate that this is three-ish from looking at that picture. So it's good to do that just to have a ballpark so that when we do our numerical approximations using those formulas, uh, we get some answers that don't seem crazy. If I got 20 or negative 38 for an answer, I would say, wait a minute, I must have made a mistake here. Um, okay, so the first problem here uh, asks us to use rectangles of equal width and upper sums, so I haven't done any examples like that yet, there are some in your textbook, uh, but upper sums with n equals 4 to approximate the value of the integral. So we're going to use rectangles here, so we need to think about the width, uh, our delta x's, how wide each rectangle is going to be. So I'm going to take the width of the whole interval that I'm looking at here from negative 1 to 1, that's 2 units wide, or you can subtract 1 minus negative 1 over however many pieces you want to divide it up into. So this is b minus a over n if you want to write it as a formula. So 2 fourths or 0 0.5 is going to be the width of our interval. Okay, so when I use those numerical approximations and I'm going to do rectangles of width 0 0.5, I can kind of think about what those would look like on my graph. Uh, we want to use upper sums. So what an upper sum means is that we're going to use the uppermost point on that interval or the maximum value of the function on that little subinterval. So on that first subinterval, this is when the graph is especially helpful. Um, you can also use some other methods to find a maximum value of a function. We've looked at some calculus methods, but from the graph here, we can look at this pretty easily and see what's going on here. Uh, so on that first subinterval from negative one to negative 0 0.5, you can look at this graph and pretty easily tell that the highest point on that little subinterval is going to be at the left end right here. So that's the height that we're going to use for that first rectangle. Um, on the second rectangle, I'll do that in a different color, the second rectangle that will go from x equals negative 0.5 to x equals 0, that little subinterval there, um, you can see that the highest point on that one is also at the left end of that subinterval. So when x is uh, z negative 0 0.5, on the next subinterval from x equals 0 to x equals 0 0.5, uh, the highest point on that part of the graph is at the right end. So on that one, we're going to use the right end point for our point uh, so that we get an upper sum. And one more here. Uh, so the one on the farthest right, when I go from 0 0.5 to 1, the highest point on that interval is going to be at the right end. So we're going to use the right end point on that one. So when we do an upper sum, we're just using the max point. A lower sum would be using the minimum point on each interval here. Okay, so I need a table of values, some y coordinates at those x coordinates. The x coordinates that I'm going to actually end up using correspond to where I put these points on the graph. 
Uh, so we don't really need one at x equals zero for this calculation, but I will for some later calculations. So I'm gonna go ahead and calculate that one as well. So I'll put a table here uh, that contains all of the values that we need. Okay, so for this sum, I've got a table of values here. So for this sum that we're gonna use here for the upper sums, uh, the points that I highlighted on the graph there are the ones we're actually gonna use. So the y values that I'm gonna use are these. These are approximate values. Uh, it might also be helpful to write them in exact form just to get a little bit more uh, exact value here. My function y equals e to the x squared, it's pretty easy to plug these x values in. Uh, so those would be the approximate y values or I could use the exact y values when I plug in x equals negative one, I'll get e to the negative one squared, which is just e. Uh, when I put in negative 0 0.5 and I square that, I'll get 0.25, so e to the 0 0.25. Uh, this middle value here is exact at one, e to the zero is one. Uh, this one will also be e to the 0 0.25 when I plug in x equals 0 0.5 and then e to the one or just e. So these would be the exact y values at uh, each of those cut points for our x coordinates. So either way, uh, if we want a better decimal approximation, we might use these exact values to start with and then round at the very end. I'm gonna just go ahead and use these approximate values that I have here, uh, but sometimes you might want a slightly more accurate intermediate step and then just do all your rounding at the end. So you might use those exact y values. All right, so rectangles of equal width here, so I can factor out my delta x. My delta x is gonna be 0 0.5. And then I'm just gonna add up the y values for the points that we decided that we needed here for this upper sum. So 2.718 and 1.284 and 1.284 again and 2.718. Okay, so when you add up all the stuff that's in the parentheses here, we get uh, 8.004 and then when I take that answer times 0.5, we'll get 4.002. All right, so that is an approximation for our integral. So we could say that our integral from negative one to one of e to the x squared with respect to x is approximately 4.002. Now, when we looked at the picture, we said it should be about three-ish. Uh, you can also see from the picture that those rectangles, if I'm using upper sums, that will be an overestimate. So it's not out of bounds to expect that we might get an answer that's a little bit above three-ish. An upper sum will always be an overestimate and a lower sum would always be an underestimate. But uh, that's a ballpark estimate for upper sums. Okay, so we're gonna look at uh, the next couple of approximation methods that we talked about, trapezoidal rule and Simpson's rule. And then we also wanna focus on being able to use those error approximation formulas for those two. Okay, so for trapezoidal rule with n equals four to approximate the value of the integral, uh, we need our table of values, which I had up above. We'll just scroll up and grab those values. I'm not gonna put it here again. Uh, but for trapezoidal rule, uh, you can either memorize the formula or you can think about finding the areas of trapezoids. Uh, but you've got the delta x over two, and then you've got your y values one times each of the ones on the end, two, times all of the ones in the middle. And so I'm just gonna add all these values up. And so last time I did that, I used a chart and I multiplied by twos and ones, added up everything in the chart and used that to help me with my organization. You can do that as well. This is an approximately equal. Uh, you can do that as well this time if you want, but uh, I'm just gonna write this out here. All right, so our first Y value at the left endpoint on our graph here, our first y value was 2.718. And we're gonna have all these y values, including the middle one here for this approximation. Remember the trapezoids are gonna have all those sides. Uh, so we're gonna need this one at x equals zero as well. So I'm just gonna be using all of these y values, 2.718 on each end, and then two times all of those ones in the middle, add that stuff all up, and we're gonna get our approximation. So 2.718 plus two, times 1.284 plus two times one plus two times 1.284 plus 2.718. Okay, so when I add up all of the expression inside the parentheses here, 
um, I'm going to have 0 0.5 over 2 times, and then the sum of everything inside that parentheses, remembering to multiply the appropriate things by 2 first, uh, you should get 12.572. And then when I multiply that by 0 0.5 over 2 or 0 0.25, I get 3.143. Uh, that seems better. Our initial estimate by just eyeballing it was, we said, 3-ish. So that is pretty much 3-ish. Okay, but the new part that we want to focus on here is being able to use this error formula. Uh, so in the box here is the error formula as it's stated in your book and your class notes. Um, so we want to use that error estimate formula for trapezoidal rule to estimate how far off our answer might be. Um, so, this formula says the second derivative needs to be continuous, not the original function, but its second derivative. I went ahead and gave you the second derivative of the function up here, but you could find that if you needed to. Uh, that is a continuous function everywhere, including the interval negative one to one. All right, and then this theorem in the box here says then the error in approximating our integral by trapezoidal rule is given by this formula here. So that absolute value of e sub t stands for the error in trapezoidal rule. I'm just going to write that out in words here. Is less than or equal to, all right, our b minus a, that comes from our interval. So our interval goes from negative 1 to 1. So that will be 1 minus negative 1, or 1 plus 1 cubed, over 12 times n squared. Our n that we used was 4. And then we need the max of the second derivative on that interval. Okay, so we know how to find max values of functions using calculus, but this second derivative actually should be pretty easy to think about because of all the squares and the pluses in there, that the largest value for that derivative function is going to occur at when x is 1 and negative 1. Uh, when x is 1 and negative 1, that's when you're going to get the largest value in the exponent for the e, and it's when you're also going to get the largest value in the parentheses for the 4x squared plus 2. Uh, so when I plug in either x equals positive 1 or negative 1, I will get that that second derivative, I'll just plug in 1 here, would be e to the 1 squared, so e to the 1, times 4 times 1 squared plus 2, or 6, so 6e. All right, so in this formula here, the max of the absolute value of the second derivative on that interval is 6e. All right, so if I simplify this a little bit, 1 minus negative 1 is 2, and then I'm going to cube that. So my numerator is 8 over 12 times 16. I could go ahead and multiply that out if I want, and then all of that times 6e. Okay, so we're just going to put that into the calculator and do 8 divided by 12 times 16, take that answer, times 6 times e, and you should get approximately 0 0.6796. All right, so that tells us that our approximation using trapezoidal rules should not be off by any more than that, at least. So we know that we were in with, within at least about 0.68 of the correct answer for the integral. All right, we're going to do the same thing with uh, Simpson's rule approximation here. Okay, so we're going to use n equals 4 again so that we can use our table again and the same values that we had before. So Simpson's rule with n equals 4 says that our integral from negative 1 to 1 of our function is approximately equal to delta x, that's 0 0.5 over 3. And then remember on Simpson's rule, that's where you've got the patterns with the 1s and the 4s, 1, 4, 2, 4, and then I'll be ready for my last y value here since we're, we have just n equals 4, our last one will be multiplied by 1, which of course doesn't change anything. When we did the table, we went ahead and multiplied by 1 just so everything was lined up. All right, so 0 0.5 over 3, and then these are the y values from our table, so 2.718 plus 4 times 1.284, plus 2 times 1, plus 4 times 1.284, and then plus 2.718. Okay, so if I go ahead and do the multiplications by 4s and 2s where I need to, and then add all that stuff up that's in the parentheses, maybe you want to use the table to help you organize that. Uh, the stuff in the parentheses should add up to about uh, 17.708, and then when I take that times 0 0.5 over 3, 
I get about 2.9513 to four decimal places anyway. To four decimal places, 2.9513. So three-ish, that ballpark what we expected just from eyeballing it at the beginning. All right, and then we're going to use this error estimating formula for Simpson's rule here. So it's pretty similar to the one for trapezoidal rule. Uh, some of the numbers in the formula are a little bit different, and it uses a fourth derivative. So this notation we talked about when we first did derivatives, that sometimes when you have higher order derivatives, you use this parentheses notation. So that's a fourth derivative, which I gave you. You could find that if you needed to. Uh, we need to think about the maximum value of that fourth derivative on the interval from negative one to one. And again, because of all the squares and the pluses there, it should be relatively easy to see that that maximum value of the fourth derivative, maximum value of the fourth derivative of x on the interval from negative one to one, uh, is gonna occur when x is one and negative one. So I'll just plug in one of those, I should get the same answer for either of those. So I'm plugging that x equals one or negative one into that fourth derivative. So I'll get e to the one, or just e, and then when I put x equals one in the parentheses, I'll have 16 times one, so 16, plus 48 times one, so plus 48, plus 12. And I'll just add all that stuff up, and I'll get 76e, the max value of the fourth derivative on our interval. Okay, so our error formula for Simpson's rule is gonna be less than or equal to b minus a, so that's one minus negative one, or two to the fifth power this time, over 180 times n, our n was four, we had four subintervals to the fourth, and then times the maximum value of the absolute value of the fourth derivative, so uh, 76e. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and simplify. Uh, one minus negative one is two, so two to the fifth, which is 32, over 180 times four to the fourth, and then all of that times 76e. So there's some little individual calculations to do there with your powers and everything, but when you go ahead and do all that calculation, you should get about 0 0.1435. So that tells us that our error in our Simpson's rule formula is off by no more than 0 0.1435. Okay, but uh, we talked, or I guess I didn't make the videos, but I put some on uh, the links in our webpage for how to use the FNINT function on your calculator. Um, and so actually the best way to get a pretty good approximation is to use that FNINT command on your calculator. If you haven't watched those videos yet, be sure to watch those. And tell your calculator to do an approximation of this integral uh, from negative one to one e to the x squared dx. And it's gonna give you an approximate value, but that's actually a pretty good approximation. Uh, it'll do a very small partition, and it uses some variation uh, not exactly these same approximation methods we used, but a uh, similar idea there. So it's just adding up and dividing by a bunch of things. Uh, but you'll get 2.92530342. So of all of these approximations we've done, that's really the best one. Notice that's not really too far off from what we got from using Simpson's rule. We were pretty good with Simpson's rule. We got about 2.95. And here we have about 2.93. So, uh, but from the calculator, that's gonna be the most accurate of any of these methods, really. Um, but you need to make sure that you understand the formulas so that you can use Simpson's rule or trapezoidal rule if you're asked to.